While the long-contemplated mystery has finally been solved, exactly what sort of crime would one have to commit to actually get locked up without bail in San Francisco? Of course, you can attack randos at Walgreens and rob the store out of business all you want. You'll be back to do it the next day. But attack a Pelosi? And you're done. My office will be filing a motion to detain him without bail. And that is based on what is obvious and severe public safety risks that the defendant poses. That is Brooke Jenkins, the new San Francisco district attorney. And in fairness, she got that job after the last guy was recalled for exactly that reason, releasing criminals back onto the street. So maybe some principles actually are being restored in the city by the bay. But if they are... It doesn't look like transparency is one of them. And I get it. With investigation ongoing, you don't always dump all the evidence into the public eye immediately. There is a process, and that's fair. But the problem is, it appears as though the process is just being invented on the fly. The DA and the rest of the investigators are holding on to the definitive evidence that, according to their own description, clearly shows exactly what happened in this tall tale, without specifying any particular time at which they'll actually release it, or what events need to take place before they do. Someday. Eventually, maybe later, is apparently the standard for a case of not just massive public interest, but given the political nature and a public official's involvement, a case of a public need to know. Because if we're expected to believe that our democracy is indeed under physical attack, then we need to know exactly who is doing it and how, so we can be as vigilant against this threat as they constantly urge us to be. And yet, according to plenty of media coverage and political reactions, we're conspiracy theorists simply for asking to see that evidence. It's yet another term that's transformed in meaning recently. The tinfoil of old was sticking to an outlandish theory despite the available evidence. Now the tinfoil is wanting to see that evidence to form your own opinion at all. Republicans are spreading conspiracy theories about the attacks, says this coverage in The Independent. Megyn Kelly, Tom Cotton, John Cardio, and more, all of them pushing the insane idea that, hey, maybe we should see the footage. Megyn Kelly said, let's see it all. Tom Cotton called for the police to release video of the attack. John Cardio said the story as told doesn't make sense, so... Let's see the tape of what actually happened. And for such a conspiracy theory, nobody is asking for theoretical evidence. They are asking to see the pile of evidence known to exist. Multiple different video angles investigators themselves confirm. The district attorney confirms that the police body cameras were not only active, but the video they captured includes the attack itself in detail, she said in a CNN interview. Her court filings confirm the attacker, David DePap, observed ring cameras everywhere. Now, unclear if he meant on the Pelosi residence itself or just in the neighborhood, but as a point of fact, seemingly every corner on the Pelosi home has clearly visible security cameras. But maybe they were wired by the same guy who installed the Epstein cell cameras, and these two mysteriously turned off at the worst possible time. We also learned of a third video source on Tuesday, U.S. Capitol Police, who have a live feed of the Pelosi home, apparently at least an outside angle because Capitol Police first learned of the attack when they saw the arrival of San Francisco police on the scene. But dang it, they just weren't looking when DePap actually broke in. During the attack, no one was watching the security camera feed because the Speaker of the House wasn't home. So if all these questions are unfair or conspiratorial to ask, there is a very easy way to stop people from asking them. Just show us what happened. And if you can't, give us a timeline for when in the process it will be fair for you to do so. Because while we rely on descriptions from people who otherwise said trust us about Jesse Smollett and company, it's not just that skepticism is the deserved default. It's that the facts are getting tossed into a blender, constantly changing like a retelling in the game of telephone and not set in an objective source that anybody can view for themselves. Consider the facts of the assault itself. They remain murky. 
First, it was reported, supposedly from police sources, that Paul Pelosi was struck repeatedly with this hammer. He was hit in the head several times with a hammer. Days later, the DA says, we don't actually know how many times he was hit. We are also still fleshing out how many times he was struck in the head. And again, this despite the entire attack captured on body cam footage in detail, According to the same woman, likewise, who actually let police into the home has been a changing fact. It was originally reported wrongly, at least now investigators say wrongly, that a third person let police into the home. Then the DA said it was either Pelosi or DePap who let police in, but it's unclear. Again, despite what she described as very clear body cam footage. So at this time, it's unclear which of the men opened the door. And then the next day... In her court filing, the DA said it was Paul who opened the door. So unclear Monday, but very clear Tuesday, despite no new evidence introduced. And that may seem like a trivial fact, but how it fits in the claimed timeline of this attack is actually crucial. Because we're supposed to believe that Paul Pelosi opened the door, greeted officers, but then suddenly got into a hammer fight that the police couldn't stop despite this immediate proximity. In fact, the police watched it all and had a conversation about it during, according to the DA's description. Drop the hammer, police shouted. DePap said, um, nope. Police asked, what is going on here? All during a hammer grabbing wrestling contest. DePap got the hammer away from Pelosi. Pelosi stepped back and DePap lunged at him, striking him. And the police watched all of this from apparently about two feet away without intervention until after Paul was already knocked out in a pool of his own blood. And that is a very strange story, but stranger still are the security circumstances that enabled this well-narrated attack in the first place itself a subject of conflicting claims. The DA says there was no security present at the Pelosi home. There was no security present and that he was able to break the window to a glass door. Now, in fairness, maybe she just means no security personnel present, not necessarily no security systems, but point of fact, to some degree, there were both. Because we can see the camera systems on the home. It seems impossible to believe there's no corresponding alarm or alert system. And the attacker was witnessed, and the break-in itself was heard by a security guard working a nearby property, though he also somehow didn't think it was suspicious enough to call police. The private security guard working near the Pelosi home on the night of the attack saw a man dressed in black carrying a large bag. After hearing banging, that security guard never called police. And it seems double odd that the Pelosi's neighbors apparently take security much more seriously than the Pelosi's themselves do, especially in the aftermath of all of the January 6th threats. But the threat is even more specific than that. The San Francisco police chief says these threats against the Pelosi home are common. We've had uh, postings at the Pelosi residence in the past. I mean, this is the, the, these threats aren't new. Let's be very clear. Oh, yeah, it happens all the time, which is why absolutely nothing was done to stop it. Even in the moment, nothing was done to stop it. Excuse me, kind sir, slowly pulling your arm back, narrating your preparation for this forthcoming violent hammer swing. Please reconsider your approach to this dispute. And if that conversation was weird and the security situation was weird, the circumstances of the 911 call are weirder still. How the call was even placed prompted questions at the story's breaking. Supposedly, DePap invaded Pelosi's bedroom and demanded to see Nancy, but when he learned that Nancy wasn't home, DePap threatened to tie Paul up until Paul asked to go to the bathroom where his phone was charging, a request that DePap granted. So a hostage taker who understands what it's like to have to take a piss really, really badly. How paradoxically threatening and kind at the same time. And that threatening kindness was a continuing theme. At first, it seemed like maybe Pelosi placed this call in secret from the bathroom. No, it turns out that DePap was a polite participant in the call. When a recording of police dispatch became available, it was notable that police said Pelosi called DePap a friend. He stated that he doesn't know who the male is, but he advised that his name is David and that he is a friend. But according to the DA, it was not Pelosi who identified David by name and called him a friend. It was DePap himself. During the 911 call, emergency dispatch asked Pelosi if he knew the man in his home. 
Pelosi said he did not. The dispatcher asked DePap for his name, and he responded, my name is David. Asked who he is, DePap said, I'm a friend of theirs. What sort of kidnapper willingly allows his victim to call police and then participates in the conversation? And yeah, people who know DePap say he's a drug-addicted crazy person, so perhaps that's all the explanation necessary. But again, it's a matter of conflicting presentation from investigators. The DA said on Monday that DePap intervened with the 911 call when he realized that Pelosi had placed it. The defendant, realizing that Mr. Pelosi had called 911, took Mr. Pelosi downstairs near the front door of the residence. But in her Tuesday court filing, the DA described this ongoing conversation with dispatch that DePap participated in and DePap's knowledge that the conversation was recorded. So somehow he's both cooperative with and enraged by the 911 call he participated in, but didn't know about. And just like the three different video sources, there is also a recording of this 911 call that would clarify exactly what happened here. But also just like the video, you can't see it or hear it. Are you planning to release the 911 call or any body camera video? Not at this time. Um, we're going to find out today the, the speed at which this case will proceed. But Nancy Pelosi can. A source familiar tells CNN this week that Pelosi family members get to hear the 911 audio and watch the body cam footage. No word in this report if the delete key will also be made available to them. Now, of course, allowing the family to see the video first is a common investigation practice for good reason. I don't actually dispute that rule in principle. I'm not demanding now. I'm just asking when, because as a matter of San Francisco body cam footage policy, release of the video to the greatest extent possible is the goal. But so far, indefinite delay has been the goal. The DA's only articulated timeline for release is if this footage gets introduced in court. When and, and if will, will we see the uh, body cam footage? When it is made available during a court proceeding, that will not that's the way that this works. But according to the policy, that is not actually the way it works. The rule on the release of San Francisco Police Department body cam footage is not if introduced in court. It's to the greatest extent possible by default, unless a witness is endangered, not the case here as the attacker is already in custody, or if release would jeopardize the completion of an investigation that's debatable, I suppose, but if the entire attack is captured on video, as the DA says, there's not much left to investigate, or if release of the footage would violate privacy laws. That is where the obstacle is. And of course, I wouldn't necessarily argue that anybody should be compelled to release footage of their home's interior, but the Pelosi's do have the full discretion to do that. If you want me to buy your story, then please voluntarily show me what happened. And discretion creates another problem with the DA's stance, the discretion of what is introduced in court. If only what is introduced in court will get released, well, what happens if they only introduce 10 seconds of it? Or in an unlikely but possible scenario, what if they introduce no body cam footage at all and just rely instead on witness testimony or other evidence? Because after all, they have the attacker's confession to breaking and entering. They have the attacker's confession to the assault. Perhaps they don't even need to introduce the video to secure their conviction. And as of now, the rule from this DA is that what video isn't introduced in court, either in part or in full, will not be released publicly, even if that is not an established San Francisco policy in any way. But I guess that does make some sense. After all, believe what we tell you, not what we show you, is a motto these people apply to every other issue, too. It's a great economic recovery. Just don't look at your wallet or your retirement account. Gas prices are way down. Just don't look at the calendar before June. Or, as they just got busted for on Twitter this week, social security payments are hitting a decade high thanks to Biden's leadership. Just don't look at the inflation that caused it. Turns out that for this story, just like every other they tell, the book is apparently way better than the movie. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab. That is at M L. Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.